Today we're looking at adding loudspeakers to your layout to add sound. We've covered before the importance of adding extra uh, life to your layout in terms of movement, animations and so on, uh, lighting effects, traffic lights, lights going on in buildings, street lights, etc. And we've already covered sound in terms of sound players. So today we're looking at adding loudspeakers to your layout to get the sound out to your ear. So we'll look at various things. Is it appropriate? Well, of course, adding sound makes a big difference to how people perceive a layout. But it's not always appropriate to have every sound on the layout going on at the same time. If you've got a layout that's got factories, it's got mines, you know, it's got people working with buzz saws and so on, you don't want the whole lot to be going on at the exact same time. Bit cacophony. So you want to be able to make sure that the sound that you're representing is appropriate. And also we'll look at the issues of scaling sound in the same way as we scale uh, you know, O gauge, double O gauge, N gauge to scale down the size then we have to scale the sound accordingly. We'll look at how speakers work and their placement and whether we want to make them switchable either by uh, the operator or by uh, triggers in the system. So let's start with one of the bugbears about sound and that's the actual sound levels themselves. I'm sure you've all been to an exhibition and as soon as you walk in the door you can hear the layout at the other far corner 50-60 feet away which is not at all realistic. So, what do the professionals say? This is a very helpful quote, I believe, from Jim Wells from the Fantasonics company. He's basically saying that you should be able to only hear a sound at a layout by getting closer to the source. And he quotes a seven foot rule. What he means by that is if you're more than seven feet away from a sound source on a layout, you, you shouldn't really be hearing it very loud at all. But we all know that audio is simply the movement of airwaves from your voice or whatever audio source emanating out, radiating out, until it reaches your ear and your ear translates that back into an audio message to your brain. So what does that mean in terms of audio levels? If we assume that this point here is the source of the audio, the human voice or your loudspeaker, then it's pushing the air in front of it out away from itself towards you. And that's fine. But as you go further out, the air that you've now pushed out has to push the air in front of it out in turn. Only it's going to be a larger area that it alters. And then further out, it's a larger area again that it alters. So as it goes out, the intensity, the eye, the intensity is diminishing all the way out. It's called the inverse square law. If you move movement R, you get intensity of that. But if it's 2R, it's not a half the intensity, it's a quarter the intensity. If it's 3R, it's not a third, it's a ninth of the intensity. There it's there. So if that's the amplitude of the audio, the intensity of it at the source, by the time you get that distance away, it's dropped to a quarter, that distance away is dropped to a, a ninth and so on. So if we imagine for the moment these are measured in feet for the seven foot rule, then by the time you've moved out seven feet from the source, you're down to only one forty ninth 
of the audio amplitude. So if we work from the idea of a 7 foot distance from the source, then in double O it's 7 feet times the scaling, so an effective distance of 532 feet. And if it's an N gauge, it's 7 times 148. It's effectively almost a third of a mile scaled between your ear and the source on the layout. And I think you'll agree, there are not too many audio sources you can pick up a third of a mile away, apart from the most loud ones. Right, let's start looking at loudspeakers themselves, how they're constructed and choices. Here's a simple schematic a side view of a loudspeaker. We have a cone, the one that's going to vibrate the air. It's got a magnet and on the cone is the winding that's going to come from your amplifier or your, your sound player. And of course the magnetic effect and the coil compared with the magnetic effect of the magnet will mean there'll be movement. And as the current and, and the field changes in the coil, then the movement of this piece here will go out and in. That will move and turn the, the uh, cone inwards and outwards and vibrate the air accordingly. And of course, it then reaches your ear so what is available commercially? There are many to choose from, of course, but these are some common examples from soundtracks. Most times you're going to buy the largest you can reasonably fit into your layout, depending on the space you have available to, to mount the speakers. So size is a factor. Uh, price is a factor, but we'll look at the frequency response, the power and the impedance. In terms of frequency response, you'll see that they vary a reasonable amount. Some will go down to 250 hertz, 200 hertz, others will only go down to 475 hertz. Some will only go up to 9 kilohertz, some will go up to 20 kilohertz. So you'll have to choose the speaker depending on what kind of sound is coming out. For example, if it's the rumble of machinery, that's a low frequency, you wouldn't be wanting one that only starts at 475 hertz. You'd want one that uh, would come out at say 200 hertz. If you're trying to play music or high frequency sounds you'll want something that's better than 9 kilohertz. You're looking for something that'll go up to 20 kilohertz. So the frequency is a factor. In fact you've got three things to look about. The minimum and maximum frequency as I spoke about. The power handling which is measured in watts. And it's not the amount of power the speaker consumes when they quote 2 watts or 1 watt or half a watt or whatever. It's the maximum handling. How much power can the speaker usefully put out before you get distortion. And the other issue is the impedance of the speaker so it matches the requirements from the amplifier or the sound player. Now we've talked about impedance, we've got resistance and impedance. They're both measured in ohms. It could be a bit of a, a nuisance. But resistance simply means it opposes the flow of DC. If you had a varying frequencies coming through a resistor, then it won't affect the amount of current that's drawn. Impedance is the opposition to the, the flow of 
alternating current and it can depend on the amount of reactance as they call it. So impedance is really resistance plus the reactance, although they end up both measured in ohms. Loudspeaker impedances of the international standard, which says the minimum impedance mustn't drop below 80% of the rating of that speaker. In other words, an 8 ohm speaker at various frequencies should never drop below 6.4 ohms. A 4 ohm speaker should never drop below 3.2 ohms. It's not talking just about manufacturing tolerances here, it's talking about the, the impedance changing over different frequencies. Here's a chart from Leap, which is a well-known speaker manufacturer for a 6 ohm loudspeaker. And you can see that the actual impedance changes dramatically between 10 hertz and 40 kilohertz. And the nominal impedance that we spoke about earlier for the 6 ohms is here at the 200 hertz. But it doesn't stay at 5 or 6 ohms across the whole frequency range as you can see. So if we mention a, an impedance, it's a nominal impedance, but we're concerned about the minimum impedance. A common issue with sound is distortion. The sound just doesn't sound right. So what are the causes of distortion? There are many factors that could possibly cause distortion. We'll look right now at the overdriving of speakers and we'll look at the rest as time goes on. So there's back to our image of a loudspeaker and we said that the coil would move out and in between the magnet. The construction of the speaker is such that the coil is supported at the rims of the metal assembly with movable membranes. Let's have a closer look. Here's a typical loudspeaker. You can see it's got a cone, but where it meets the casing, it's got a spongy material to allow the cone to move. So within limits, that's the point, I can make it go back only so far. If I put my finger around the back, I can only make it push out so far. There's a limit to the movement we have in this cone. A limit to how far back it goes and a limit as to how far out it's able to travel. So the cone of the speaker has got physical limits. It can only move so far in one direction and so far in the other direction. And if you try to turn up the amplifier, make it go further, it can't physically move beyond those limits. And the result is that any intelligence in the audio beyond those are lost. You don't get the full reproduction of the original audio hence the distortion. So that's one way you get distortion, you're trying to overdrive the speaker. Another way is if you're trying to overdrive the amplifier itself beyond its limits. And we can investigate that next. So here we have an audio waveform and these are the limits of the audio amplifier. 
currently is a fairly low level signal, we can increase the amplitude as long as we keep it within those limits. But if we go beyond that, we try to drive the signal beyond the limits that the amplifier is capable of, the result is what's called clipping. So all the audio information above that level has got no effect, does not come out to the speakers. The part in red is the only part that makes its way through to the speakers. The rest are just cut off. And what you have is what it should look like and what you actually get. And in the extreme cases, it can lead to very bad audio reproduction. Here are the stereo tracks from a previous presentation. As you can see, the maximum amplitude of the signal never exceeds the maximum capacity of the amplifier. But later on in the track, I've deliberately increased the amplitude beyond the amplifier's capabilities, and you'll see the effects of, and hear the effects of, clipping. So let's try that. One of the members contacted me, he's read an article about PWM, Pulse Width Modulation. We covered that, I think, a fortnight ago. I'll look at it again briefly in a moment. But normally, we're changing the, the Pulse Width ratio. And this article was saying, let's use voltage to change frequency. So, the member wrote some code and said, to me, this is all about him. I look at it and see. Of course, the quality of reproduction in some tannoy systems and station announcements and so on are so poor that you might want to actually uh, introduce distortion like that for more accuracy. But that's another issue. Let's move on now to actually uh, how we wire loudspeakers. There are a number of issues involved here. Most loudspeakers for model railways are 4 ohm or 8 ohm impedance. And we shouldn't mix the two necessarily. They're meant to match the amplifiers that go with them or the sound players. No harm is done if you put an 8 ohm speaker into a, a module that's meant to be 4 ohms. All that happens is that the sound is not as loud as you'd expect because of the added impedance. But don't put a 4 ohm speaker onto a, an amplifier that's designed for 8 ohms. There are other issues regarding the wiring and placement of speakers that you see there, and we'll come to them shortly. So, if you have an ordinary 4 ohm speaker, and you have a 4 ohm system, that's fine. If you only happen to have 8 ohm speakers to hand, or if you want to have a couple of speakers around the layout, then it's perfectly permissible to parallel up two 8 ohm speakers and you get a, uh, a 4 ohm impedance as a result. Or if you have a collection of 4 ohm speakers you can wire them that way. It allows you to have four speakers around your layout but they're all playing the same audio at the same time. But the effect of impedance is still 4 ohms. And the same principle applies to 8 ohm speakers. You can use one on its own. You can wire up two 4 ohms in series this time, if that's all you have. Or you can wire two 16 ohm 
speakers in parallel if that's all you have. That brings me to the issue of the physical mounting of speakers. That's the representation of the speaker. As the coil moves out and in, the air at the front of the cone is pushed out and sucked in, pushed out and sucked in, pushed out and sucked in. But of course, in the rear of the speaker, the same thing's happening. The air at the, the back has been rarefied and, and compressed as the cone moves back and forward. However, think of it this way, that when the cone goes forward, it creates a high pressure in front of it because it's pushing the air out. But it's creating an area of low pressure behind it because the cone is pulling rather than pushing. And that's got consequences for the efficiency of the speaker. Because if you simply have the speaker mounted without any boxing or baffling, then the result is this. That some of the high pressure does not end up getting radiated out, but in fact goes round to, to match the low pressure area at the back. And the result is that the amount of air that is moved for any particular amplitude is much reduced. And that's why they use baffles and boxes. A quick demonstration with a piece of, piece of card with a hole cut in it. Volume level without a baffle. With a baffle. So it's in our interests to have the largest speaker possible because it moves the most air. It's the most efficient, especially if we're trying to move audio at low frequencies. And then we use a baffle, a piece of material, usually wood, with a hole drilled in it that we can mount the speaker on. Gives you extra radiation because you're vibrating the material as well as the cone. But more importantly, you're stopping the high pressure from getting round to match the low pressure at the back. So all the changes from the cone are projected forward. If you're fitting a baffle or a speaker, then you normally will want to cover it up on the layout with a bit of cloth or some sort of grill to stop dirt getting in. Or perhaps a piece of lichen over the hole lets the air out but prevents debris from getting in. So what kind of baffles do we have? Well we have the, the flat baffle, just a simple piece with a hole drilled in it, usually wood, could be metal or plastic but usually wood. And that helps the radiation and it prevents the negation of the high pressure into the low pressure area. And of course, the bigger you make the material, the more you reduce these losses. But you can't do that indefinitely. So most audio systems use some kind of box system. Here's the open back. We've got all the benefits of the baffle at the front, but extra baffle so it's even harder to get equalisation from the high pressure to the low pressure. Or if we seal it, 
which has called it an infinite baffle because there's no way that the high pressure can get back into the low pressure area. And finally there's the, the base reflex baffle which is mainly aimed at uh, lower frequencies. Bass, you'll see lots of bass speakers have got some kind of um, hole here, usually a tube, because the other effect of a closed box is damping. If you're trying to push out air out the front, then you're trying to move the air inside. But the fact you've got a closed system in the back inhibits the movement of the cone, particularly at lower frequencies, in which case reproduction at lower frequencies are not as efficient. So if you do want to mount a speaker that's going to particularly reproduce lower frequencies, you have to be careful in the mounting. You'll see in the, in the left example, it's mounted on a thick piece of material, but the problem is that there's very little area here for the air to get into the back of the cone. So what you would like to do is, what you see in the right hand image, is chamfer away the material to allow easy access for the air to the back of the cone. Here's a particularly bad example, which is from a commercial product. They've mounted the speaker in such a way that there's no air allowed into the cone at the rear. Which will create a lot of damping and have a severe effect on the quality of the reproduction. Let's look now at the physical mounting of speakers on the baseboard itself. We start off by saying it's best not to mount the speakers on the buildings on your layout for, for various reasons. Most of them are closed boxes. So there's no way that the speaker can push air out of the box towards the, the listener. So you get a muffled response. Also, you don't know what the materials are like in that particular building. They could be too absorbent. If they're cardboard, or they could be resonant. In other words, they, uh, they've got a natural resonant frequency and at certain uh, frequencies of your audio on the speaker, you get vibration in the building itself. And you hear a kind of rattling, rumbling effect that you don't want. How are we going to fix them? Well, we can screw them with clamps, we can use glue guns, we can use silicon uh, sealant. So there's various ways we can physically mount the speaker. This is the way we suggest not to do it. You've got the speaker in its own enclosed box inside another enclosed box. So whether you put it on the wall or put it on the floor of the building, then you don't get the access to free air. What you might consider is cutting a hole in the back of a building that's away from the viewer. In that way, we're allowing the air to, to freely circulate. You'll see foam tape here. That's suggested to stop sound transference. In other words, the vibrations that are taking place in the, the speaker box don't transfer to the box of the building itself and you get unwanted resonances. If you've got space, there's nothing to stop you mounting the speaker under the layout, behind the building. You still get free access to air and it's well hidden from view and it doesn't disrupt the construction of your building. A few issues about speaker positioning. 
It's best not to point the speakers directly at the viewer if you can avoid it. It's best to have the speakers pointing upwards or reflecting off the back scene. It sounds more natural. And that leaves us with the last issue. How many speakers are we going to put in the layout? Where are we going to place them? And how are we going to wire them? There are three typical methods. The first, centralised, simply means you have a single player and a single speaker. And that one speaker has to cover the entire layout. Or distributed, you still have a single player with this audio source or sources. But you have one speaker for each location in the layout. In other words, one for the station, one for the factory, and so on. Or local, where you have a, a player and a speaker dedicated to each location, all working independent of the rest. Let's look at these. There's a, a, an example of, of centralised speakers. We've only got one speaker in the middle of the layout. It's the cheapest, the easiest to set up, but the least effective. The problem is that people are able to easily distinguish the sources. Even in our little demonstration layout that's only three feet wide, people know that the sound isn't coming from that corner or that corner is coming just from the middle. So it's not particularly effective. There's an example of a commercial unit using centralised sound. We have a unit with multiple sounds, but they all play through a single speaker. And you can buy various cards for various sounds. Quite an expensive option, but again with the limitations of just one speaker for the entire layout. Gauge Master do one again. Also very expensive, but centralised. I've put in a video clip here because this is an example of sound that's not coming from a DCC sound decoder, it's coming from a centralised speaker. And when I play it, hopefully you'll notice that the sound doesn't change as a local comes closer to you, goes past you. It's the same sound level the whole way. Trains leaving, but the sound is not diminishing. The train has left the building, and you can still hear it. And you can hear it before you see it on the way back. So you see that the limitations of a centralised system. The next option is a distributed system. And here we have a single source of audio files. But the audio is routed to various speakers that are placed around the layout. If you're playing a factory sound, you switch this switch. If you're playing a station announcement, the audio source is routed via that switch to the station, and so on. OK, 
commercial options are available with limitations. First limitation is the price, very expensive, £500 plus over £100 for every totty you want to add on to the system. It does support six individual speakers. It can do crossfades, in other words, you can pan between one speaker and another. But it's limited to, to local sounds only. So you want a factory sound, station announcements, farmyards, all that kind of thing. Even though you've paid that amount of money. Now in our case, this is our little exhibition, or one of our exhibition layouts up in Dune. And we have speakers in various locations because we want to have station announcements here. We want to have the, the fire engine sounds up here. We want to have the school sounds here. We want to have the, the factory sounds here. We want to have the train whistle as it comes round. There's a sign here that says whistle. We want to hear the train whistle. So we've got sounds in various locations. So we distribute it this way. We have a dog that comes out and barks when the train passes. But it's so close to the school that we can get off with a single loudspeaker to cover them both. Similarly, the train whistle happens on the upper deck here, close enough to the station to have one speaker for that. With separate speakers for the fire engine, the drill and the saw. We don't use the commercial equipment for this. We use an Arduino and a DF player. We've got five different speakers, so the sound is chosen either at random for the school. Sometimes it's playing the school bells, sometimes it's playing the ice cream van, sometimes it's the kids playing. But there's also ones that are triggered. Triggered by a totty at the station to play the station announcement. Triggered by the, the dog for the dog to bark. Triggered by the, the whistle to play the whistle sound. They all then choose the correct audio uh, command to send to the DF player. It sends the audio out and is routed to, to the particular speaker depending on the switch. And all these digital outputs here decide which speaker gets which audio track. Much cheaper and it covers lots of different areas on your layout. When you've got more than one loudspeaker, more than one audio source, you've got to decide how you're going to control them. So as you see here, you can have a sound that's permanently on. If you want a background of uh, seashore, the waves breaking on the beaches, or uh, the birds twittering in the trees or whatever, you want it to be in a permanent looped cycle. Or you might want random, you know, the cow only moves at certain times. Uh, or you might want to shuffle sounds as we have in the up and down. That little layout has got a school that plays various uh, sound effects at random. You may want some sounds that are absolutely timed. The church bells ring every quarter of an hour. You might want events that are synchronised. You want thunder and lightning to be the same, you know, be synchronised with each other. You want the sound of a welder and the flashing of the welder to occur at the same time. Crossing gates, the, the bells and the movement of the gates should be synchronised. You may want sound that you control, so you have a switch to control it. Or you may want it to be automated by various triggers that train on track indicators that detect the presence of a train at a particular point and you get a station announcement or you get the, the sound of a whistle or you get the sound of a, a wheel squeal or whatever. So we want to be able to switch sounds on and off. 
We can use ordinary relays for that purpose, they work perfectly well. Or if you prefer, or you're short of space, you can use reed switches like the type shown there. Just get four pins, two for the coil and two for the in and out of your audio. I think that's what we use, if I remember correctly, on the uh, up and down control panel. Or you can use the CD4066B quad bilateral switch. Just an IC, a 14 pin IC. Quad means there's four individual switches. I'm only showing two there. Each switch has got three pins and in and then out. The bilateral means it doesn't matter which of the two you choose. It works like an ordinary switch in that regard. And the third one is the control to switch it on or off. The 4066 will happily work with a pick chip or a, an Arduino or various totties. And finally, local sound. In this case, we have a, still have a speaker in each location, but they've got their own audio source. Examples of that are the, the siren or the steam whistle, 35 quid. We can do that as you saw here. Or a water tower that's operated by a, a totty. The train comes into that siding and the water tower animates and plays the sound at a certain price. We have the steam emulator kit for a couple of quid. The train comes into a siding and you hear the steam release. Or the train comes into various totties here to provide the sounds depending on what you want to, to do, all locally. And that's where we are, folks. Hope there's some useful information in there. Uh, one final word. That's all, folks.